Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. We are also authors and invite you to check out our books, including my books, Potted and Pruned, Homegrown and Handpicked, and Seeded and Sodded, my trilogy of gardening humor. And my book, The 2030-Something Garden Guide, A No-Fuss, Down-and-Dirty Gardening 101 for anyone who wants to grow stuff. You can ask for any of our books at your favorite bookstore or find them online wherever books are sold. And speaking of online, you can find us as The Garden Angelist on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. And we'd love for you to join our Facebook group, The Garden Angelist Garden Club. Now on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Hello, Carol. How's it going? It's all good. Guess what this week is? Uh, Ash Wednesday. No, That's right. Okay. It is Ash Wednesday, but, but gardening-wise, what is it? Monday was my book, Potted and Pruned. It was its third birthday. Oh, and last week was my book's sixth birthday. Happy birthday, book. Yes, February books, they're the best, aren't they? They are often when gardening books come out. Yes, we got a book that has inspired us, and so we're going to do something a little bit different today. Completely different. Flowers, Veggies, and All the Best Dirt is inspired by a book that we recently got. Tell them, D. The book is The Earth in Her Hands, 75 Extraordinary Women Working in the World of Plants by Jennifer Jewell. Yes, and we both got review copies of this from Timber Press, and I think it just came out last week. I don't know. Uh, it hasn't. It hasn't been out long. It, this is hot off the presses, as they like to say. And we we both are thoroughly enjoying this book. We are. And so, a little bit about Jennifer. Jennifer has a podcast called Cultivating Place, which has been around for I don't know how long it's been around, but it's always a very good listen. She always has interesting. Interviews with various guests, which is something we don't have. We don't have guests on our podcast. Not so far. Maybe one day, but right now we can't figure out how to do it. It's too hard for us, so we do not. Uh, Yes. Well, her podcast has been around since 2016. And I don't know if this book is because she had the podcast, she met all these amazing people. But it's just, these are 75 amazing women in the plant world. Yes, and I heard she made a huge spreadsheet And had all of this criteria. And what we found cool about the earth in her hands is that we know some of these women, some of these extraordinary women, or we have already been inspired by some of them. And that's how we came up with our flour, our veggie, and then all our best dirt. Right. So let's go with the quote. There are wonderful quotes from everybody. Yes, and we use the quotes from the book. That's There are quotes that were in the book that we thought were particularly inspiring. They all are, but here's our first quote. We are all better for a bit of gardening by Sarah Raven. I love Sarah Raven. I don't know Sarah Raven, but if Sarah ever hears this, you hold a special place in my heart. I have been to Sissinghurst. It was a dream come true, and I love what she and her husband have done with the property, and I love I love her books. I have two. I have two. I have the one on Sissinghurst, which is about Vida, Sackville West, who is her husband's grandmother, right? Correct. And I also have another one of her books that you don't have called The Bold and Brilliant Garden. And I can't remember why I bought it, but I'm so glad I did because I always say that bold and brilliant colors do really well in hot, hot places like Oklahoma that have really harsh sun. Because if we garden like, you know, like a lot of people do in the English color palette, which is light colors for the most part, um, that's the traditional palette, we, uh, we will, everything will be faded to a seriously sad gray, kind of whitish brown. It won't be pretty. But if we use bold col- colors in Oklahoma, then they do a lot better. So I bought this garden a long, I bought this book a long time ago, and I just loved it. And I loved it so much that I almost loved it to death. All of its pages are falling out. Really? And I, I don't seem to have that book. I have the book on Sissinghurst, which I have read, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, 
I've looked up information on Sarah in the past. And the thing is, she used to be a physician. And now yeah, she's she a, was. She's a florist. She's a garden designer. And she's all about the plants. She is all about the plants. And her favorite flower, according to the earth in her hands, is Dahlia Babylon Bronze. How do Dahlias do in Indiana, Carol? They they do all right. They um, I find Dahlias a little bit worky because they do have to be dug in the fall if you're going to mm-hmm. overwinter them. So, And they're kind of expensive to treat like annuals. Yeah, a little bit like buying tulips to treat like annuals, but we do it sometimes. I love dahlias. If you're going to grow dahlias in Oklahoma, you need to grow the smaller ones, not those great big dinner plate dahlias. You'll need to stake them. You might need to dig them. It depends on your soil. They do not like wet clay. So in wintertime, they don't die so much from the cold here usually. They die from lack of drainage. And I've done both. I've dug them. I've not dug them. Um, My personal favorite dahlia is one called Juanita, which is an heirloom that you can get from old house gardens. And it is named after my grandmother, I say, because my grandmother's name was Juanita. Well, that is lovely. I'll say I, I always run into somebody selling dahlia tubers at a garden show in the spring. And mm-hmm. I always kind of succumb and buy some. And yeah. this one this one guy told me, he said, if you take those big, and I'm going to say two-gallon size and up plastic nursery pots that you bought shrubs or something in. And he right. said, plant them in there. And then get them started inside. And then when you take them outside and you've got to acclimate them, you've got to harden them off. Right. He says, dig the hole and plant the pot and all. Huh. And then in the fall, when it's time to dig them, when it's getting frosty out there, he says you can just sort of dig up that whole pot and then empty it out. You've got to clean off the tubers and and um, let them dry a little bit, but then you got to... Keep them from drying out too much in the winter, but not getting yeah. so wet that they rot. So that's what he said. <laughs> They're kind of hard, and I've overwintered them in the greenhouse. You can also do it in your garage, and I've overwintered them in pots. I've never planted the pot before, but that's not a bad idea since you're going to lift them anyway if you don't mind be- digging a big old hole. And here, people hate digging holes because our soil is so heavy not in my house, but a lot of places. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if they're worth that much trouble. Usually I just plant the really tough ones like Bishop of Landaff or Bishop's Children's Children or Juanita. And, you know, I just let things go as they may. And sometimes they come back and sometimes they don't. Right. Well, they would almost assuredly not come back in Indiana. And I, I will say two things. One is, yeah. uh, out at New Fields, which is the former uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art, the horticultural display coordinator, who's got a fancy curator title now, Irvin ATN. He says yeah, our he, friend. <laughs> our friend Irvin. They've got a cutting garden, and he's tried to grow dahlias, and he's struggled growing dahlias. So if Irvin can't grow them very well, just up the road, I can't. Yeah. I don't really feel bad. I don't feel bad anymore. No, don't feel bad. If dahlias don't work for you in either of our climates, don't feel bad. It's not England after all, and it's not Mexico. So Mexico mountains, which is where I think dahlias are from. But don't don't quote me on that. Okay, so that was pretty cool. You want to segue into veggies? I got a I got a tidbit about dahlias. Oh, go ahead. The tubers are edible, according to our friend Ellen Zakos. Oh, I don't want to eat those. Okay, well, let's move on to veggies then. Okay. The quote for veggies is, My goal is to spread the joy of gardening as a practical, meaningful activity that connects people with each other and the earth. That's by Renee Shepard, who is also profiled in this book. Right, and Renee has a wonderful seed company called Renee's Garden Seeds. Generous to offer the garden writers like us some samples And the seeds are always wonderful, and she has interesting varieties. And I'm going to tell you next week what I got from her that you might have had to order from England, and she had in her catalog from the United States. Oh, just tell me now so I can be jealous. Well, I would, except I forgot. I I need to find my piece of paper. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay. So we aren't exactly talking about, although Renee does sell both vegetable and flower seeds, we're actually talking about another great vegetable gardener that we are friends with, and her name is Ira Wallace, and she's the face and voice of Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which is a co-op. And it's a co-op that focuses upon heirloom seeds for the South. She's also the the co-founder of the Heirloom Harvest Festival at Monticello. Yes, that Monticello. And she's the author of the Timber Press Guide to Vegetable Gardening in the Southeast. Now, Ira, now now that our listeners know all this great stuff about Ira and all the things she's done, does Ira come across as somebody who toots her own horn, as we like to say? Absolutely not. She is the most humble, delightful Delightful. (laughs) person you will ever meet. Ira is the best. I have sat on a bus with Ira many times and just chatted with her instead of touring a garden because talking to Ira is like, I don't know, talking to history and culture and she's just the most amazing person i love her to death yes and so she's really all about the vegetable garden and saving heirloom varieties of seeds especially those that have been grown in the south and we should say that the southern exposure seed exchange is a co-op so there are a lot of gardeners who contribute seeds for it and then they sell them and so why should we tell our listeners about And seeds that are grown in a certain area. Oh, horticulturist friend. (laughs) Yes. Well, D. Seeds that tend to come from a particular area and have been grown for several um, seasons. Yes. They are better, they're often better adapted to the climate of that area. So they might perhaps be more resistant to environmental factors where you grow. So if you choose heirloom seeds from your area, they might grow better. And actually, I profiled um, this group, the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, in my book, and I did because I buy seeds from them every year. Not only do they have things that nobody else has, and although Oklahoma isn't in the southeast technically, we're considered the middle south, it doesn't matter. These seeds do really well in Oklahoma heat. The problem is, is they've become so famous and so popular that it is really hard to get seeds from them anymore. You have to go early. Yeah, they sell out because the, the supplies are limited. But they really are about saving these heirloom varieties, too. And so they work with the USDA Seed Bank, Bank the Seed Savers Exchange, and So True Seeds, other organizations that are really trying to keep alive all these heirloom varieties. And aren't they focusing on collards, among other things? Yes. She read a book about collards, a southern tradition from seed to table that was written by Ed Davis and John Morgan, and that's kind of got her interested in making sure that all the seeds that those authors had collected got deposited in these seed banks so these old collard varieties could be saved. They also save a lot of old corn varieties, old tomatoes, and there is a precious, precious photograph of Miss Ira on Um, in this book and she's holding three different kinds of tomatoes and the smile on her face is just beautiful she is one of my favorite people yeah she's one of those people that smiles with her eyes she does and we love her dearly so thank you miss ira for saving so many seeds you and everyone else that works at a southern exposure seed exchange we really appreciate the work that you do yes so our next quote are you ready for it d i am I'm interested in the root. Because I am basically a botanist and a scientist, I can't bring myself to grow a big blousy thing with all top and no roots. Many people don't understand that a lot of top is less valuable than a lot of bottom. And that is Marina Christopher, nurserywoman and owner of the Phoenix Perennial Plants in Hampshire, England. It'd be pronounced Hampshire. Hampshire. I was going to say, <laughs> I pronounced it like somebody from Indiana. You did. Which, you know, the only re- I've just been there. That's the only reason I know. But um, I used to say Shire, too, and one of our English friends really corrected me kind of strongly one day. So I'm careful now. Um, I love this quote because she's absolutely right. You are a horticulturist. Um, I took a ton of botany. And as we know, the roots are really, really important. The better root system you have on a plant, the better the plant's going to do. Now, I do grow big, blousy things but I care a lot about roots. 
Right. You know what I thought was kind of funny? Yeah, what? So so she's in England, and so in England, the big Chelsea Flower Show in the spring is where people go and they introduce all kinds of stuff. Right. And she, in 2018, she introduced Trifolium wildenovii, a California native annual clover, <laughs> and an absolutely beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, English English gardeners are enamored with American native plants. They loved them way before we did. And now we're finally getting into our own native plants, which is pretty cool too. It is a beautiful clover. There's a great picture of her and she's inspecting her clover plants and she just has another great smile. Right. And she has a book we should link to. It's called Late Summer Flowers. Came out in 2006 and that fascinates me naturally. Oh, me too. Anything I can do to help the bees in late summer. And there's a revised version that's scheduled to come out in 2021. So we'll have to watch for that. We will. I wonder who's going to publish it and if it'll be here in um, in America. Because sometimes we get their books and sometimes we don't. Well, it says it's the publisher, Francis Lincoln, and we get many of their books. We do get many of Francis Lincoln's books. Thank goodness we have a connection to them. So speaking yes. of books, should we move on to our bookshelf, which we've already kind of talked about a little bit, the book that inspired <laughs> The Earth in Her Hands by Jennifer Jewell. We made exactly. a whole podcast episode, D, because we're crazy. We are. And I let Jennifer know this. I forgot to tell you. I let her know on Instagram. I messaged her and she was excited. So I'm glad she's excited. We love the book. Um, it's a good book. Oh my goodness. It's a good it book. Is. So here's our quote. Gardens matter. So does your patio, your porch, your front stoop, or your apartment's sunny windowsill by Michelle Slatala. And this uh, Michelle is out in California. She's one of those other people. You you see this picture of her and you think, she and I could be friends. She and I could be friends. I know we could be. What I like about this is it's exactly the same thing, I believe, that Doug Ptolemy's trying to say, which is, Gardens do matter. And I wrote a whole post on my blog about why gardens matter. And it's a very popular post because they matter for us. They matter for the environment. They matter for our very souls. Every single author, they kind of have, or not author, every single person that she's highlighted in the book, she has a little section about their work, their plant, their plant journey. Right. And then they have a whole section called Other Inspiring Women. And each of the 75 people listed three or four other women with their in the plant world that inspired them. And some of them are deceased and some of them are current people. And so that's just a giant rabbit hole, D, a giant rabbit hole as you go through and you figure out, oh, so Michelle was inspired by Helen Van Pelt. You're right. In 2003. And Catherine S. White, who we know as a writer, editor, and gardener. Yes, we both um, read her books. So, and you just go, and each time you turn the page, it's like, oh, no, there's another person I need to look up. There's another person I need to find out about. Yeah, I love this because not everybody is inspired by the same people. And that that really, really touched me, that women are so inspired by other women and because we've been inspired by other women too, not just women, but women sometimes don't get the recognition that they should in any industry. And it's so cool to see how many women work in our industry. I thought that was really neat in a very positive way. Very inspiring. And I would think that any young person who's thinking about a career in plants, um, show them this book to see all the different ways that people can get involved with plants. So while we were coming up with our dirt this week, um, we were discussing how challenging it must have been who to decide to include and who to leave out of the book. And uh, Jennifer's a really nice person, and I think it must have been agonizing to try to figure it out. Um, we thought it was nice that she allowed women to feature women that they were inspired by. It's kind of an honorable mention. But we also came up with a list of who we would add if the book could just go on and on and on. Right, and naturally it can't go on and on and on. So our criteria was... They had to be alive, obviously. Right. They have to be alive. They can't be dead. And they had to have changed the garden world in some way or inspired us. I think that's right. Fair. Right? So the first, yes, that is very good. 
The first person we listed was Rosalind Creasy, who's a powerhouse, and she started front yard gardening. Before it became a catchword, um, she grew crops and vegetables and things in her front yard in a very creative and artistic way, and she created that whole movement. Right, and the book that she has is wonderful, and I probably should turn around. It's on my shelf right behind me. But I think what's inspiring about it is by putting her vegetable garden in the front yard, and I think she's in Southern California, it she really is. invited the neighbors and the kids to come along and see what was growing, and she gave them a chance to taste stuff that was fresh grown, and I think that really inspires other people to go ahead and grow at least one tomato plant or add some strawberries or whatever. Yeah, so grow I'm- a tomato plant in a nice large pot. So the name of her book was Edible Landscaping. That was one of them that she has more. But Edible Landscaping is the movement that she started, and it is also... Um, it's been, I think that Edible Landscaping was reissued a couple of years ago. And wonderful book. She's a very interesting person to listen to. If you ever get a chance to go hear her speak, very good. Right. And I've, I've talked to her at Garden Com meetings and uh, sat with her at breakfast one day. She's just extremely down to earth and very approachable. Um, okay, so the next one that we named was Ruth Rogers Clausen. And I have a little, and she does a lot of books for uh, Workman Publishing, which is another great publisher. I, it was a dream come true. I have a little story. Can I tell my little story? Do we have time? Yes, please. Yes, we have time. Okay, so at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show, I got asked to be on a panel. And you never know when you're going to be on the, it wasn't even a panel. It was like three people speaking on a particular topic. And it was Gardens Across America. And they had a local speaker who, I can't remember his name, but he was good. And then there was me, and then there was Ruth Rogers Clausen. And I remember standing there trembling because it was Ruth Rogers Clausen, because I've read her all my life. And I was so nervous And then I sat back down after, and you never know who you're going to speak with until you get the actual program. And so when I sat down, Ruth reached over and touched me on the leg, and she said, you did a great job. And I I, I can't express how wonderful our industry is about everybody. I mean, I have never met anybody in our industry who wasn't inspiring and wanted to help other people, and I tried to do the same. And I just, she, you know, I used to read her in Country Living Gardener, and she's written some beautiful, beautiful books. And then you also listed Heather Holm, and I will admit she is new to me, but... Um, oh, my gosh, Heather Holm, another groundbreaking... She's a, um, I can't think of the word right now, entomologist. Thank you. Thank you, Brain. Um, she's an entomologist. She studies native bees, native insects, Um, She's written several books on bees, and she wrote one for the Xerces Society that's on how to attract bees to your landscape that's really, really good. And a really nice person came to speak here in Oklahoma. She's considered one of the biggest authorities on native bees. Very good. And I put Summer Range Oaks on the list. Summer lives out. She lives in an apartment in Brooklyn with like a million plants or Hundreds of plants. <laughs> Not a million, but a lot. And she has a very popular YouTube channel, and she really has done a lot, I think, to move forward the whole houseplant movement and really introduce people to a lot of unique and unusual houseplants. Well, and she's also an entomologist, and um, her the name of her whole movement is Homestead Brooklyn. That's the name of it. But she's written a couple of books, too, including How to Make a Plant Love You, which is a great title that's easy to remember. Right. And she's um, she's been literally all over the world with that book. And so that's why I put her on the list. I think she's really reaches out to a lot of the younger generations and shows them that houseplants are really cool. Yes, and she's very approachable. She actually came to Garden Calm last year and was... Very, I, I thought she had some really good information for people. The next one on our list, you actually added, but we both agreed that she doesn't really get her due. And that is Pat Lanza, who wrote a book about lasagna gardening and kind of ha- started that whole lasagna gardening where instead of digging into the soil, you layer on organic matter and soil and organic matter and soil to make a nice fluffy garden bed. Right. And actually that whole movement began with Ruth Stout 
And then Pat will tell you that she took Ruth Stout's ideas and she incorporated them and came up with the title Lasagna Gardening, or her publisher did. But it took off and she has been all over the world too, speaking to garden clubs. That is one of her things that she does and her book is still in print, which is pretty amazing after all this time. It is pretty amazing. She herself is fairly much retired in Tennessee, but um, really inspired a lot of people to go out and garden without doing a lot of heavy digging. Again, another person that we learned from who is also very approachable and very nice. The next one, I don't know if we added her together. It's Tova Martin. Tova Martin still writes for a bunch of the Meredith publications, which other people would know as Better Homes and Gardens, Country, Gardener, um, all of those publications. She still writes for those. She's written a bunch of books on houseplants. And before Summer Rain Oaks was even, like, thinking about gardening, Tova Martin was talking about houseplants because she lives, like, like Summer, she lives back east, and she, it's very cold in the middle of winter, and you need something as a gardener to do. Right, and she wrote a lovely book last year that won the Gold Award for writing, and that was A Garden in Every Sense and Season, which is just I lovely love that essays. Book. It's lovely a beautiful essays. book. And um, we are co-chairs of Garden Comms Media Awards, and connection with that, I talk to her a lot about different things. And uh, she's just lovely. Tova's lovely. She's also come to Oklahoma and, and has spoken, and I got to interview her for my blog. Very nice person. Right. And then the last person, and I put this one on, was Linda Chalker Scott, who is a uh, professor out at Washington State University. And Linda has a ton of books, and she is trying to dispel all those silly myths that come along. Right. And I think she's doing a world of good because... We've got to stop people from doing crazy stuff like putting Epsom salts on the soil, which does no good. Yeah. Um, and she just takes all these myths and just very matter-of-factly and in a scientific way shows you that there are no studies and it's not worth doing. And so I added her to the list as somebody who I think is moving gardening in the right direction. I think she's a very worthy addition, and she she is one of the writers of the Garden Professor's blog, and they also have a page on Facebook, which we talk about fairly frequently because it is so good, and it's called the Garden Professor's. So if you want to go onto that page and have a myth dispelled, they've probably already dispelled it, but just go look into their archives or ask the question, and they'll let you know if you need to go look in the archives. Very, very good information, all science-based. And anybody can fall for those myths. I had one, well, in fact, I profiled one this week, which was about pink plants. And there's a, I think it's the pink pagoda philodendron. I may have that wrong. Pink pagoda something. Anyway, it's this pink plant, and it's made pink through an artificial process. It is not a pink plant. But people are paying thousands of dollars for this plant. And that's just one example. Don't fall for right. things. Don't fall for blue daylilies, stuff like that. That's right. So anyway, lovely book, lots of good stuff to read and enjoy in it, and so we recommend it to our listeners. We sure do. And so that is it for this week. We want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, we'd love a review, especially a five-star review. That helps us get noticed and moved up into Apple's algorithm. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. It was lovely to chat with you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Bye.